I'd like to welcome you all to this Medicine for Members talk um, this evening entitled Slight Change of Title, Clinical Neuroscience and Evolution from Molecules to Man and Back. Uh, my name is Stephen Cameron. I am an elected governor here at the Royal Free London. I'll be chairing the session tonight uh, in the talk by Professor Shapiro. Um, there's also a number of other fellow governors in the audience. Um, and I wonder if I could just ask you to... Um, Stand up for a moment so people can see who you are, because all of your photographs on the website were very nicely retouched, I think. Oh, the good, 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 good looking ones are at the back, yes, of course. Okay. Um, so, as, as hopefully most of you are aware, the governors are here to represent patient interests at the free, and I hope you'll all take some time at the end of the talk um, and after questions uh, to come and talk to us about any experiences, positive or negative, that you've had at the free recently, um, because we do welcome your feedback. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, Professor Shapira is head of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at UCL, um, the Institute of Neurology. He's also Professor of Neurology at the Royal Free, Professor of Neurology and Consultant Neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. He's Vice Dean of UCL Medical School, and director of the Royal Free Campus, and we're very lucky to, to have him here. He was elected as a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 1999, um, and is a senior investigator at the Institute of Health Research uh, from or since 2012. Um, I first heard Professor Shapiro talk on the effects of antiretroviral drugs on mitochondrial function and density um, 19 years ago in, in California. Um, and I have to say that um, he made a very complicated subject extremely accessible. And I've got no doubt that he'll do the same tonight. Uh, Professor Shapiro will talk for 45 minutes, and then there'll be a chance for, for us all to put questions to Shapiro, to Professor Shapiro. So with that, over to you. Thank you very much uh, again, Stephen, for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this Medicine for Members evening. I hope you uh, enjoy the evening and, and leave with some uh, additional knowledge uh, about what uh, is a very interesting topic, at least uh, I find it so, and that is clinical neuroscience, uh, otherwise known as neurology. So the topic of, of this evening is really, I think, fairly uh, broad ranging. It's quite discursive. Uh, and what I've chosen to do is to give you a little background to some of the common neurological disorders and what has happened to them really over the last few hundred years. And of course there's going to be a number of anecdotes and sprinkled within the talk are a number of questions for you. So you'll be able to tell me uh, what you think about certain aspects of, of neuroscience. But I think more than any other branch of, of medicine, neurology has evolved. More so in, I would say, the last 50 years, whereas other branches of medicine, I think, have evolved over a much longer period. And the reason for this delay, perhaps, in the evolution of neurology is, of course, the complexity of the topic that it faces, the brain and nervous system. And I think over the uh, period of my talk, you'll see how uh, our, the human, um, approach to neurological disorders has changed quite dramatically. And there are specific reasons for that. And those are some of the things I'm going to try and bring out during this, this evening. So clinical neuroscience or neurology in the very beginning, really was an observational art. So the diagnosis of a neurological disorder depended upon observation of the patient, taking a, a detailed clinical history, what did they complain of, how did problems evolve, and then of course the clinical examination. Investigations were very limited. And the um, treatment, of course, was either non-existent or symptomatic. So they could treat some of the symptoms, and I'll show you how that has evolved over the, over the ages, 
but really couldn't do very much about the underlying neurological disease. And what I hope to show you is how, in fact, the topic has evolved. And in fact, it's not just an evolution. I, I would consider it a revolution uh, of what has happened to our study of the brain and nervous system. So now, of course, we still base our diagnoses on clinical history and examination. The patient and what they have to tell you remains paramount. But in contrast to the tools that our forebears had in order to make a neurological diagnosis, we now have a range of different specialized investigations that we can bring to bear. So imaging. We can now image the brain, and I'll show you the different ways that we can do that. Genetics plays a hugely important role in neurological disorders. And now we can identify a substantial proportion of neurological disorders with a simple blood test for a gene abnormality. Treatment has also changed. And the treatment is not by chance. It's treatment which has developed from an understanding of the disease. So an understanding of the biochemical abnormalities that may affect the brain, how the genetic abnormalities may influence the function of the brain, the nerves, the spinal cord, and how you can specifically identify a drug for a particular disease. And of course, the evolution or revolution has been that we no longer seek simply to treat symptoms, but we now seek to actually modify the disease or cure it. And I think over the next number of years in particular, we'll see neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease become much more amenable to treatments that can slow or prevent the progression of these disorders. And whilst that just a few years ago may have been quite a dream, I'll show you examples of other neurological disorders that previously have been thought to be considered impossible to treat and which we now are able to do. So, to now you might think that neurologists are pretty clever people and that they are able to go through the diagnosis and identification of uh, uh, treatments in a very logical manner. But in fact, that's not the case. Now, the first question, of course, which I have for you is, who is this? Now, if anyone knows who this is, I'll be most impressed. <laughs> But this gentleman here actually had insight into um, actually not just science, but human behavior and human imagination. This was Horace Walpole, Earl of Oxford. <laughs> now, it was he that um, was so enchanted by an old Persian story about the princes of Serendip. And the three princes of Serendip would, within their rather limited world, wander around making fantastic discoveries by pure chance. So he coined the term serendipity to express this ability to make a discovery seemingly by pure chance. Of course, others, uh, much later, Albert Einstein said, well, actually, that never really happens. Uh, it's the art of understanding and observing and integrating what appears to be chance discoveries that really is an indicator of intelligence. But the concept of serendipity, of course, is not just applied to science, but even to romance. So this is uh, a, a, a famous film, uh, Serendipity. It, uh, I think it was in the um, early 2000s that uh, John Cusack and uh, Kate Beckinsale, and Kate Beckinsale there, you'll remember, is the daughter 
of the Beckinsale that uh, was in porridge that unfortunately died very young. <laughs> so serendipity plays an important role, I think, in, in science, in many observations, but particularly, I think, in neuroscience in the early years. So let me go on to the next aspect of, of the evolution, I think, still, rather than revolution. So the evolution of neurological observation and disorders. Now, I'm not going to go too far back. In fact, I'm only going to go 200 years back. And we're about to see the 200th anniversary of the description of Parkinson's disease by James Parkinson. James Parkinson was a physician who lived and worked in London and described the clinical disorder that he called paralysis agitans, or the shaking palsy. And he did this by observing, not examining, just observing six people that lived in the vicinity of Hoxton that all appeared to have the same problems neurologically with slow movements, shuffling steps, tremor, etc. And he produced this um, book, which is a marvelous description of all of the clinical features of Parkinson's disease, simply by observation. And he described a number of things, and uh, here's an uh, early drawing of a patient with Parkinson's disease. He described uh, the sort of problems that these patients develop, the change in posture, the difficulty in walking, the tremor, etc. Of course, those patients that he observed had never had the opportunity that Parkinson patients now have in terms of treatment. So he was able to describe the untreated form of Parkinson's disease. So we're coming up to the 200th anniversary, and next year you'll hear a lot more about James Parkinson. There are a number of, of meetings and congresses here in London to celebrate his life and his, his discovery, if you will. So I'm going to move forward, still sticking for a moment with James Parkinson, to this gentleman here. Jean-Marie Charcot was a very famous uh, French neurologist, uh, and here he is with his uh, Légion d'honneur. But he practiced at the Salpêtrière, and he was an extraordinary man, again, a neurologist who made a number of different observations. So he described some of the clinical and pathological features of multiple sclerosis. He described what is known as the Charcot joint, which is a type of arthritis. He talked about Charcot aneurysms, which are weaknesses in the blood vessels of the brain. He described Charcot Marie Tooth disease, which is a, a, a peripheral neuropathy with wasting of the muscles, particularly of the legs. He even described cholangitis or biliary disease with Charcot's triad of uh, pain, jaundice, and fever. And remarkably, he described a number of individuals in France with what's called progeria. Progeria is an extraordinary disorder where individuals age at an extremely accelerated rate. So by the age of 16, they look as if they're age 80 and have many of the problems of 80-year-olds. And he described some of those people. But in the context of James Parkinson, he also described Parkinson disease or paralysis agitans after James Parkinson and was um, given to name the disease that he described, Parkinson disease, after James Parkinson. So he is, he is a very um, sensible and, and um, uh, excellent neurologist who clearly was involved in a number of different disorders. He also developed an understanding of a different part of neurology that was come to play, which came to play an important role and still does today.
And that, of course, is the clinical demonstration. Now, the picture here is of uh, Charcot. Here you see with his patient, here a young lady, uh, being propped up by somebody. I don't know if it's possible to turn the lights down just a little. If it is, that would be very helpful. And here you see the uh, French neurologists in attendance. Now, it has been suggested that that individual there is my uh, grandfather, um, but that's pure speculation. <laughs> so, um, I want you just to have a look at this picture and uh, note the patient and her posture and note also what is around the room because it is of some significance that I'll come back to towards the end of the talk. So that was Charcot, uh, an extraordinary uh, physician of his time. Now another extraordinary physician was Sir William Gowers, who practiced just down the road at the National Hospital, Queen Square, and he again described a number of different neurological disorders. Now one of these was a sign that he described called Gower's sign. And this was observed in a number of relatively young children, all boys, interestingly, who had difficulty because of weakness. And what he described as the way that these children uh, got about from the floor, for instance, was to oops, was to climb up their legs. And this sort of sequence of events to get them into an erect posture is called Gower's sign and is indicative of weakness of the legs of a particular type, usually of muscular dystrophy. So there's a little bit of history of some of the movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, some of the neuromuscular disorders, the neurologists of those times dabbled in a number of different areas. They uh, uh, involved themselves not just in neurology. But still, what these people did was observe and document. There was no investigation. So all diagnoses were presumptive and based upon observation. So the revolution began, really, with investigations. The ability to understand better what was going on in the patient. So investigations began to change the practice of neurology. Now, here's a, a, an early picture of a lumbar puncture. Uh, and Lumbar punctures involve the insertion of a fine needle at the bottom of the back into the fluid space that drains from the brain. Now, the information that that test provides is extremely important in many different disorders. Of course, it's used for the diagnosis of meningitis or encephalitis. It's now used in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis and so on. So it's, it's a very common uh, procedure. It's very safe, and uh, actually now, uh, although it has a bit of a bad reputation amongst patients, it actually now is quite painless and straightforward. But if you look back then, you'll see that here's a, here's a patient on their back in the characteristic lumbar puncture position. And first of all, uh, here you see three attendants doing the lumbar puncture. Well, I don't think the NHS could now afford to have three attendants for every, every lumbar puncture. So, in fact, people, neurologists or whoever, just do them on their own, and all the facilities are available to do that. You can see that the back has still been cleaned, probably with iodine. Here they are measuring the pressure of the spinal fluid, which tells you about the pressure in the brain. You'll notice that no one's wearing any gloves. Uh, so 
there was always the risk back then of the introduction of infection. Um, but nowadays, I, I think, I, I've never seen a case of infection with a lumbar puncture in, in about 30 years. So things have evolved and, and, and changed. And nowadays, of course, it's a much more straightforward procedure. Very commonly done, as I say. So being able to access not necessarily the brain itself, but at least some of the fluid that surrounds the brain began to give people an indication of some of the changes that could occur that could be used as an indication of an underlying diagnosis. But probably the most important step in the investigation of neurological disorders came with imaging, being able to see the nervous system. Now, it started not with being able to see the nervous system itself, but at least being able to see the skull that surrounded the brain and also the spine that surrounded the spinal cord. So simple x-rays occasionally be, were able to be used to make diagnoses based upon the contour and the shape and the um, maintenance of the bone tissue. So this is a perfectly normal skull. But the next picture shows you a fracture of the skull. Now, plain x-rays of the skull are hardly ever done nowadays because they only give you a limited amount of information. It's much easier to do a CT scan, which I'll show you shortly. But back when x-rays became available, this sort of x-ray often saved people's lives because the identification of a fracture of the skull with a decline in conscious level often allowed neurosurgeons to intervene and perhaps drain off a large hemorrhage that surrounded the brain and was pressing on it. So plain x-rays did play an important role in the evolution of neurology, but particularly neurosurgery. But all of that changed with the introduction of the CT scanner in the late 1970s. Now CT scans, uh, this is a now modern CT scan, when they started they were huge machines that would uh, take up a whole room and were quite claustrophobic. This modern scanner can provide you with detailed analysis of the interior of the skull and the structure of the brain itself. And here you see slices of the brain from the bottom of the skull right through to the top. And you can see the structure of the brain and the supporting structures or ventricles, these little black areas, which are the fluid-filled sacs within the brain. So the use of the CT scanner significantly improved ability to make diagnoses of structural abnormalities, such as brain tumors, hemorrhages, or strokes. Now CT scanners are so common and, and, and so easily available, almost every hospital has one. So for instance, when somebody comes in with a head injury of a, of a significantly significant type, they'll go straight into the CT scanner to see if there's a fractured skull, see if there's hemorrhage within the brain. Patients with certain neurological problems, symptoms and signs can go straight for a CT scan. And in many hospitals, there's no waiting time for a CT scan for those who uh, are deemed uh, to need one. So this ability to image the structure of the brain completely revolutionized diagnoses. Now, you'll have noted that I've stressed imaging the structure of the brain because this type of imaging actually doesn't tell you anything about function. So, for instance, this could be a CT scan of a dead person taken just a few hours after death. So the CT scan doesn't tell you about how the patient is. It simply tells you about is there anything wrong with the structure of the brain. And you make the interpretation of that based upon the clinical examination. 
The next evolution of brain imaging came with the MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. And this provided extraordinary detail of the brain, of the different components of the brain, of the brain cells, the white matter, and, and different fine structures of the brain. It was able to tell you more about the ventricles and the fluid that surrounds the brain. And importantly, serial scanning over time told you what was happening to the structure of the brain and whether the brain was changing, for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, where the brain gets smaller and thinner. So MR imaging, again, was a step change in our understanding of the brain and ability to diagnose diseases. In addition to looking at the structure of the brain tissue, MR scanning also provided us with an opportunity to look at the blood flow into the brain. So here you see at the bottom the heart, and you see the major blood vessels that are going up to supply the brain. And you can imagine the importance of being able to do this, looking for, for instance, blockages within the blood vessels that provide blood to the brain and cause strokes. Or abnormalities of weakness in the wall, such as aneurysms. So now we can identify the, these sort of problems relatively easily with an MR scan and an injection of uh, dye. So again, this represents an important evolution from clinical observation through to diagnosis and investigation. Imaging so far that I've shown you, again, only tells you about structure, nothing about how the brain is working. Well, that changed a few years ago with what's called functional, FM, uh, functional MRI, or fMRI. fMRI is a way to look at the structure and the function of the brain together. And the way that that is done is to do a straightforward MR scan, but to look at the blood flow in different parts of the brain. It won't come as any surprise to you that the more you use your brain, the more it metabolizes, the more blood it needs. So if you use a bit of your brain, it will need more blood. And if you can devise a system to follow the blood flow around the brain, you can map which parts of the brain are using more energy and more blood in response to certain functions. So this scan here, this fMRI, is showing up an increased blood flow in the back part of the brain that looks after vision. And what's happening here is that this individual is lying in a scanner looking at a screen that's changing in terms of its picture and black and white chessboards, which is activating the back part of the brain picked up by this increase in blood flow. Now, this is a very simple example of how fMRI is used. But fMRI is now able to, to plot the different areas of the brain that are activated in response to different actions. And that, of course, has provided us with an enormous amount of information about the relationship between anatomy and structure within the brain which in turn, of course, allows us to understand better the basis of disease. Another important evolution in being able to look at the brain, apart from the fMRI, is to also look at the chemicals in the brain. Because the chemicals of the brain change with certain diseases. And I'm going to bring you back to Parkinson's disease. So, although James Parkinson described his disease 200 years ago, it was about 50 years or so ago that we first identified that the problem in Parkinson's disease 
was a deficiency of dopamine. Dopamine is a normal chemical in the brain. It's produced by certain brain cells. And when those brain cells begin to die or don't work so well, they don't produce enough dopamine, and the patient gets Parkinson's disease. We can now see the level of dopamine in the individual's brain. So this is a scan of a patient who's just been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And what you see here, these two bright blobs here, well, this one's bright, certainly brighter than that, is the level of this chemical dopamine in the brain, in a particular part of the brain called the striatum. And when we see a brain that's got one side that's very low compared to the other, then that supports the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and indicates that the dopamine is deficient. Not only is it helpful in making the diagnosis, but it's helpful in also following the patient. So for instance, in less than two years, you can see the progression in the loss of dopamine and in less than three and less than four. It's interesting how the disease starts on one side of the brain, but progresses on both. And this sort of imaging is, I say, helpful in diagnosis, but also important in testing some of the drugs which we're now looking at to slow down the progress of Parkinson's disease. So we can use this type of scan to see if the drug that's now being used is actually slowing down this type of progression. So this is another type of functional imaging. Moving on from imaging to molecules, well, the investigation of neurological disorders has again been revolutionized by the ability to look at, at different chemicals within the body. So, for instance, in blood tests, we've now been able to identify what we call autoimmune diseases. So where the body reacts against its own proteins and produces antibodies to its own nerve tissue or its own DNA to cause diseases like encephalitis or to cause diseases like inflammation of the muscle. These diseases, which simply couldn't be specified before, can now be identified very clearly with a blood test. I've mentioned briefly how the genetics revolution has completely changed our understanding of human disease, but particularly neurological disease, because quite a substantial majority of neurological diseases have some genetic component. And they may be what we call single genes that run in families, or what we call association genes, where you have to have a number of different genes to cause a particular disorder. We've also begun to understand the importance of certain elements, and I've just mentioned two here, copper and zinc, in the function of the nervous system. And deficiencies or excess of either of these can cause significant neurological disorders. And a protein called alpha-synuclein, which I'll come back to in a moment, a very common brain protein, crucially important in the development of Parkinson's disease and, and also in certain types of dementia. We can now test for this by a simple blood test. So the evolution or revolution continues in uh, neuroscience and being able to help us identify different disorders, but more importantly, give us insight into what sort of things we can treat with. So let me now change tack a little bit to pick up on some of the neurological disorders that I'd like to tease out of, of the revolution, if you will. And let me begin with the next question that I have for you is this. So you may wonder, uh, well, First of all, you may wonder what that red thing is on the, on the right. And, and if you do happen to know what it is, what's it doing in a uh, talk on neuroscience? So the first question is, who knows what that car is? Yes, very good. It's a, it's a Ferrari Dino. So does anyone know what that is? 
it's, it's, it's a muscle. It's a picture of a muscle down a microscope. Does anyone know why I should show a picture of a Ferrari Dino with a picture of human muscle? muscle car. Sorry? It's a muscle car. It's a muscle car indeed. <laughs> Well, it's certainly a certainly very valuable muscle car now. These, these cars are selling for about half a million. So the, the story behind this is actually straightforward, but it also takes me back to that picture that I showed you uh, of Gower's sign. Remember I mentioned William Gower's and how he described children, mainly boys, uh, who were very weak and had to climb up their legs from the floor, and he described Gower's sign, muscular dystrophy. Well, this is a picture of uh, a muscular dystrophy biopsy from a patient with what's called Duchenne muscular dystrophy, another French neurologist who lived around the time of Charcot. So what's the connection with a Ferrari Dino? Well, Enzo Ferrari, of course, was the, uh, was the uh, engineer who fathered the uh, Ferrari uh, cars and dynasty. Uh, and uh, Enzo Ferrari, the uh, great founder of the Ferrari business, was a racing driver for Alfa Romeo. And he said, being a true Italian, he said, if I have a son, I'll stop racing. He didn't say anything about daughters, but he said, if he has a son, he'll stop racing. And he had a son that he called Dino. And true enough, he stopped racing cars and went on to design and build the Ferrari dynasty that you now know. And Dino Ferrari, his son, was of course a school to become the next owner of and leader of Ferrari. But sadly, Dino had Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So he named the car Dino Ferrari after his son, because his son died during the development of, of this car. But the, the connection of, of this story to um, the evolution of clinical neuroscience is that Enzo Ferrari then was a huge benefactor to muscular dystrophy research. And probably was the reason behind muscular dystrophy research developing so rapidly to a form of treatment that I'll show you next. So, first of all, they discovered the genetic basis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which are mutations in the dystrophin gene. This is a gene that is on the X uh, chromosome, so it's, it's uh, 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 really manifest in, in boys and rarely in females, but it can be. And there you see the Gower sign. So this is the basis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy mutations in this uh, protein and gene. And the work that they sponsored not only identified the genetic structure and cause of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but also helped to develop a very uh, novel way to try and cure the disease and get round the problem of mutations in the dystrophin gene. And this is called a process called exon skipping. Now, I'm not going to describe this in detail, but it's a very neat way for uh, certain chemicals that you can put into the cells that will recognize a mutation or a missing bit and simply skip over it to then carry on building the rest of the protein instead of the protein being built only up to a very small amount. So what you end up with is a big enough protein with only a little bit missing that still functions quite well. And this so-called exon skipping is now in clinical trial in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this is going to be one of the first genetic treatments for uh, a very important neurological disease. And it has its basis in what I think is a, a very interesting story. Now, the next success story in the neurosciences, I think, comes from multiple sclerosis. 
Multiple sclerosis is uh, a, a hugely important neurological disorder. It has a worldwide prevalence, although, as you'll see from this uh, picture, it's much, much more common in the northern than the southern hemisphere. And particularly, the further north you go, the higher the number of individuals who will develop multiple sclerosis. It's very low around the equator. And even, for instance, in the UK, between the southeast and the north of Scotland, there is a significant difference in the number of people who develop multiple sclerosis. Now, we never really understood, nor still now do we understand, why there is this huge geographic difference in multiple sclerosis. There have been many theories. Is it a virus that only really thrives in the cooler weather? Or is it something else? Well, recently, the something else has been, possibly, exposure to sunshine. Because the vitamin D levels in your body obviously correlate with the amount of sunshine that you're exposed to. And the people that live in the southern hemisphere have a lot more exposure and higher vitamin D levels. And those in the north have the reverse. And the difference in vitamin D levels are now considered to be an important contributor to the risk of multiple sclerosis. Now that risk is established relatively early in life, but it appears to be an important one. Now, it's not the only one, because genetics also plays an important role in multiple sclerosis too. But not in a simple familial way, but often a slightly more complex way. You've got to have a lot of different genes interacting. So there we have an important neurological disorder. Interesting, remember, first described in a pathological uh, way by uh, Charcot uh, in the 1800s. But the revolution of, of neurology, neuroscience, and imaging in particular, provided hugely important insight into how one might begin to treat this disorder. Watch this video and look at the arrows. This is an MRI scan. This is a patient with multiple sclerosis, and the arrows are pointing out the different attacks that the patient has over a few months. I'll show you that again. Sorry. So here you can see the patient is developing these white blobs, which are areas of demyelination, at a relatively rapid rate. And these all leave scars. And there's a basis to multiple sclerosis. Now, the ability to see attacks in an MR scanner provided the in incredible opportunity to see if drugs could be used to actually prevent or slow these down. So you'd know if your drug is working. And that provided the basis, together, of course, with important immunological advances, to the development of a range of immunotherapies that has transformed the outcome of multiple sclerosis patients. So one is able to diagnose this disorder early, to offer treatment to the right sort of patient who's relapsing and remitting, to help prevent them progressing. So this is an extraordinary success story in neuroscience that's evolved really only over the last 15 years that has transformed the outlook of multiple sclerosis. And it's how the different strands of the neuroscience revolution have come together to enable us to do that. Now everyone knows what this is, so I'm not going to sh ask you that whether this is the Brandenburg Gate or not, because, of course, it is. But it's a slightly modified Brandenburg Gate, and it's a Brandenburg Gate seen through somebody who's developing migraine. Now, those of you who have or had migraine with aura, that's the sort of flashing lights sort of problem, will recognize that staring up at the Brandenburg Gate, you'll see this funny jagged line. This is... Uh, 
uh, fortification spectra. And as the, as the migraine attack progresses, so you begin to develop more of these and the picture starts to degenerate and then starts to blur and then you lose half of it as your migraine attack fully evolves. Migraine is very common. It affects probably 10 to 15% of people at some point in their life and can be very disabling. It's a major cause of financial economic disability in the uh, Western world. Counts for loss of billions of pounds. <coughs> now, the treatment of migraine. Well, this was the earliest form of uh, migraine treatment uh, that was used. So let me ask you now, uh, looking at that, and of course this is a trephine, which means a, a hole has been drilled in the uh, patient's head. How effective was this in treating migraine, in at least those that survived the procedure? <laughs> Anyone want to hazard a guess? Was it any good? Quite good? Very good. So, 30%, 30% of people with intractable migraine had their migraine cured by this hole. Is that surprising? Yeah, okay. The other way to treat this is that uh, if you put a frog's leg under the pillow of a patient with migraine, you would also cure 30%. And this is known as the placebo effect. And this is a rather extreme version of uh, trying to prove the placebo effect. But migraine is a disorder that is amenable, in part, to a placebo effect. And this has been demonstrated hundreds of times in clinical trials. But clearly you need a better treatment to treat more than 30%. So it's the understanding of migraine that really allowed a specific treatment to be developed. So we now know that actually migraine is caused by a spreading depolarization, if you will, sort of electric current that spreads around the brain from the back forwards. And it happens over, as you can see, just a few minutes. And this is the basis to those strange Brandenburg Gate pictures because the back part of the brain is that which deals with vision. So you can see that this electric current distorts the individual's vision and produces the uh, clinical features I showed you before. But this, and an understanding of the chemical that was the basis to this, allowed the production of a much more specific therapy for migraine than a hole in the head. And these are the triptans, which were developed about 20 years ago, but, and, and came on the scene about 15 years ago. And these are very effective acute uh, treatments for migraine that were evolved from an understanding of the molecular chemistry that was the cause of migraine. Now, let me move on a little bit to uh, a very common neurological problem, and that is uh, stroke. 85% uh, of strokes are due to blockages of blood vessels that are taking blood to the brain. And here you can see a, a picture of a, a thrombus blocking a blood vessel. And of course, that will result in the death of tissue. And here you see the CT scan being able to diagnose uh, a, a stroke involving a very large part of the brain uh, due to an occlusion of uh, the middle meningeal uh, major artery. So we understand what's causing stroke. We know that stroke, of course, is increased by hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we try to prevent stroke by dealing with all of those. About 10 to 15 percent of strokes are caused by hemorrhages, uh, which may just happen uh, due to a weakness in a blood vessel or they may happen through high blood pressure. 
Now, these are much more difficult to treat because the former that are due to a blockage, and here you can see an angiogram that I showed you before. Now the angiogram is being put to good use to diagnose what's wrong with a patient. If you look at the arrow there, you can see that this blood vessel tapers off to a very fine thread. And that's because of it's being, the blood flow is being squashed by the presence of a thrombus within the blood vessel. And this is causing the stroke. So now we have intravenous thrombolysis. So this is a drug that's given intravenously in the acute, within, preferably within three hours of a patient beginning the clinical features of a stroke, that results, that, if you like, these are called the clot busters. So here you see the clot has disappeared and the blood flow has been restored to the brain. So the combination of being able to make an accurate diagnosis and being able to treat through an understanding of the disease has now made a significant impact on the outlook of patients who've suffered this acute form of stroke. Now, I'm going to just change tack a little before I come towards the end and wrap up. Now, this is a patient with a, a neurological disorder called dystonia. And dystonia can occur in, in, in people of any age, but genetic dystonia uh, presents in young people and involves the poor individual having these terrible contortions that they are unable to control. So it leads to significant disability. And these individuals can have perfectly normal uh, mental function, so they're um, affected by this terrible uh, involuntary movement. Now this group of disorders are now known to uh, be due to genetic abnormalities. So we understand now the genetic and molecular basis of these different disorders. And uh, no doubt from an understanding of this, future treatments will be developed. But at the moment, these genetic tests are now being used in the diagnosis. Let me take you back to Jean-Marie Charcot. Now, does anyone see or notice anything about the lady? Could that be dystonia? It could, couldn't it? It could be dystonia. But remember I asked you to have a look around the picture in the room. Does anyone notice anything else? Apart from my grandfather, of course. <laughs> Have a look at that. On the wall is a picture of a patient. It's, it's actually difficult to see with the lights up, but on the wall is a picture of a patient in exactly this posture. And what this lady has is not dystonia, but hysteria. And this is one of Charcot's fortes that he described hysterical neurological disorders. So this lady actually had nothing wrong with her. She was mimicking what she saw in the picture, with it, which was a true dystonic posture. Now this interplay between psychiatry and neurology, of course, became hugely important in being able to understand the, the, the basis of, of many uh, responses to neurological disorders. And Charcot as I say, one of the uh, very first to uh, pick up on this interesting interplay. But it also reflects back on how, in those days in particular, neurological disorders were looked upon. They were almost all looked upon as madness. So patients with epilepsy were locked up. Patients with true dystonia were locked up. So that evolution of understanding of what neurological disorders are as true 
now know, we know in many cases, genetic disorders, has, I think, been a huge step forward in our human understanding of, of the brain and neurological disorders. Well, Stephen, I'm going to stop there because I think time is running or run out, uh, and I want to maybe give time for questions.